David Riggins. Hi, welcome to the show. All right, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. So what's your plan with your van? We'll get into your story and stuff, but I'm just really curious because the oh, idea of living well, in a van is very appealing to me, actually. So what are you doing? The freedom of it. Right. Yes. Well, see, what it is, is I actually, I, I do a lot of motivational speaking. I've spoke at several rallies, spoke at some recovery centers, different things. I spoke at Lost Voices of Fentanyl Rally uh, in Washington, D.C. Benjamin Lerner and Matt Keegan, they introduced me. They, that's who brought me on stage. Oh, cool. And it was like 3,500 people. And so I made a lot of connections from yeah, that. Yeah. And so what the plan is, is I have a group on Facebook called Everyone Struggles, Let's Lift Each Other Up. And so the plan is, is that group is going to know my basic location every all the time. Say you're in Columbus, Georgia, and you say, hey, we need somebody to speak at our recovery center next Tuesday. I'm on the way. Somebody out in Wisconsin says, hey, we had a rally going this next Saturday. I'm on the way. And that's so my uh, my group on Facebook is going to direct my route for, for where I go in this van. Oh, that's awesome. I love the idea of like, because, you know, you see some of those vans and they're so cool. And I think there's this is part of me being homeless for a while, too, which I know that you were. And being able to see everything that I have and feel totally safe and locked in is a very appealing still. Like, even still, you know, nine and a half years sober, like my husband spends way more money than I do. He's gotten a little better about it recently. But he'd take on these massive car payments. And I was always like, no, we need to own the cars in case we have to live in them. Like, you know what I mean? And he would tell me, Janine, the odds of us living in a car are pretty slim now. You know what I mean? Like we're not using. And I still felt like, no, you need to own a car. So you have liability insurance. You can afford the registration every year. So you don't get pulled over and they don't take it away. And you need to be able to live in that motherfucker at any time. And I still feel that way. And so I think when I see vans, <laughs> I'm like, you. oh, look at that safe place to live, you know? And like, I still think about that, you know? So it's kind of cool that you're going to be doing that and you're doing all that work on your own. Okay. I've That's never so done cool. anything like this before, but I'm really enjoying the challenge. You're just like figuring it out, like YouTube yeah. and figure it out. I've always had an engineering style mind. Yeah, so yeah. I, I've, and see, my dad's a car dealer. So, and see, I've, I've lived with my parents since I got out of ICU last year. When I got out of ICU, they, they told me I could come stay with them. I actually live in my van in their driveway. Right oh, now. all right. Okay. And I'm, if, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And actually it just showed your leg for a second when you were moving the phone okay. around. So, and we're going to get to all this, <laughs> but yeah, my leg's cool as hell right now. Yeah. You've got like tattoos on it and stuff. It looks like. Well, no, see, it's actually or like designs. My, the, it's my design of my, the group I run. Heal. Oh, cool. Help, okay. Empathize, accept, and love. Oh, I love that. Is that like a, a business that people will design, put designs on your prosthetic limbs? That's kind of cool. It's a company called Fred's Legs. Okay. That's what they do. Um, oh, they cool. have like They have like a thousand different designs that you can pick from that they'll do on it. But of course, with me doing what I do, I, no, I, branded. I, I want, my, I want yeah. my design on it. You're branded. That's like your business. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's to me. See, heal is heal is more than just a group I do online. Heal to me is a is a way of life. Like I said, help, empathize, accept, and love. I mean, that's the way I try to live now. You know how it is. When we was in active addiction, we were so selfish, and so now it's all about giving back. Yeah. Well, let's get to how you ended up in this van with a prosthetic leg with your company name on it because you didn't start that way. So. Where are you from <laughs> and what was your family like? I'm from Danville, Virginia is where I was originally from. I live in Caswell County, North Carolina, which is like 15 minutes over the line. I was a senior in high school when 9-11 happened. So I skipped school on 9-12 and went signed up for the Army. Well, unfortunately, because of the large influx of people that was going into the military at that time because of what had just happened, there were some safety precautions that were being overlooked. Well, I went through basic training. I went to AIT, which is your schooling. I was in communications, microwave systems, which is line of sight communication, computer networking and satellite communications. Then I went to jump school. Well, a safety harness fails and I fall from 15 foot and land standing upright and snap both my legs. <gasps> yeah. Tore my ACL and my MCL in both knees at one time. Whoa. But that's not how you lost your leg. That just no, no, just... this is how I got addicted to pain pills. Okay. So first, I have a couple of questions with all those. 
First, when I get someone that's old enough to remember 9-11, which is not always, which is crazy now, how old are we? This is like when adults used to be like, where were you when JFK got shot? And I'm like, y'all are old. Now <laughs> that's us. Bones. Right. Yeah, exactly. You know, now that's us. We have one of these like memories. Where were you? Because it was a Tuesday morning. Because I'm just a I few was years. in English class. Okay. I was in my seniors English. I was in seniors English class. What did they do? Did they suddenly say we need to watch something on TV? What did they say? We watched the second plane hit. They came over the the PA system and made everybody turn the TV on. Yeah. Okay. All right. I was in Georgia and I was actually bartending. This is so funny. I'm I'm like quite a bit older than my husband, and so. I asked him at one point, I was like, wait, where were you on 9-11? And he was so young, his mom had to come pick him up from school and bring him home because they got afraid of like the attacks. And I was like, I was bartending at that <laughs> time. Like, that's so crazy. But I was bartending that night. And that morning I was on my way to, I worked at an apartment complex in Athens, Georgia. I was had been going to school there and then I dropped out. So I went to UGA for a little bit. I was on my way to the apartment complex and I heard the first one on the radio. And my dad's a pilot. And so at first I like panicked, wanted to make sure I knew it wasn't Delta, but I panicked anyways, got to my leasing office. And then I called my dad just to like make sure. And he watched the second one while I was on the phone and he was like, Nina, it just happened again. And he's Air Force, he's military. And he was like, I got to call you back and hung up. And I remember that night I actually still had to go bartend. We were like the only bar that was open. I thought I was going to get the night off, which would have been great. And he was like, no. And my bar was called the Bird Dog Tavern. And it was like the most redneck bar ever. I had a picture of a hunting bird dog on the on the window in the front. And he was like, people need to drown their sorrows today. They're going to do it at the bird dog. You better get your ass in here. And I was like, <laughs> okay. So I went in. But so you were in school and they said something's happening in the country. Turn it on. And did you feel, because it wasn't immediately clear, did it become clear that day that it was a uh, terrorist attack and not an accident? I, 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 don't, I don't even think, remember. I don't think, I don't, I don't think so. Okay. I, I think they were still questionable for right. a day or so. But right. I, I know, like I said, I skipped school on 9 and okay. signed up. So you felt at least compelled that something terroristic I had happened. I come from a military family. Okay, I mean, okay. My dad was in the Army. My grandfather was in the Army. My other grandfather was in the Navy. You know, I got uncles in the Air Force. You know, so it was kind of one of those things, you know, I felt compelled. Yeah, the patriotism just, it went in overload, you know, almost instantaneously. Now, prior to that, were you a good student? Did did you play sports? Were you going to go to college? Sports, did you have no, a plan? Um, I did really well in school. I was one of those type that never studied, but still would ace stuff. I was a lazy honor roll student. <laughs> so many addicts were. Same thing. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. That's like you said, so many end up like that way. A lot of us are pretty intelligent. But we do dumb shit. Yeah. Uh -huh, basically. That's what my grandmother used to always say. How can somebody so smart do such dumb shit? <laughs> uh, before I went in the military, the drugs really was not a thing. I smoked a little weed, you know, and to me, to me, even though I don't partake anymore, I, I don't consider weed a drug. I, mean, I, I consider it a, a God given gift uh, for medicinal uses when done correctly. Yeah. But yeah, some yeah. people can't handle it. Right. I am one and, of those people. And I'm assuming well, you I mean, are. Well, you have to know yourself. No, me, I'm on probation. Oh, okay, okay. I'm, okay. I'm going to smoke the day after I get off probation. <laughs> I love the honesty. That's amazing. <laughs> I am. Um, my PO knows that, too. I get off probation on December 16th, so I got three months left. Okay. Well, also, I'm assuming for you, would that be some pain management? I don't know if you've still got pain or phantom exactly. limp. Okay, all right. Exactly. And that's see, that that's the thing. It's used properly for medicinal uses and not to overtake your life in an addicted way. And, and, you know, because one thing I will always say is I will always have addictive tendencies. You know what I mean? It is what it is. Like I was saying in the military, I get hurt training for airborne. I spent 14 months in a physical therapy ward before they gave me a fully honorable medical district. I'm a service connected veteran. So I mean, I draw a, a, a pension check from the military for the rest of my life. But I was also given a part, you know, a parting gift when I was discharged. You know, I was introduced to my best friend, opiates. I didn't know him before the military, but boy, did I meet him afterwards. So for seven years, I went to a pain clinic getting them legally. Every, I mean, massive amounts. 
all of a sudden the government says we're giving out too many of them. I literally went to my doctor, got my script, went back the next month, and they was like, we got to cut you back and cut me way back. I'm already abusing them by then. Right. Okay. So I just want a couple of uh, detail questions. So you land straight up and down on your legs and it snaps your knees, but you don't, that's obviously not when you lose your legs. So they rehab your knees. My husband's had a bunch of ACL repairs. So they do ACL, MCL repairs, and they put you in physical therapy for 14 months. That's your next journey. Yep. Because they were hoping that I could heal and get back. And it just, it was, it wasn't happening. And so that's why they did, they did the fully honorable medical discharge. What did those seven years look like when you had your prescription and what was the milligrams for oxys over the, it was Oxycontin, I'm assuming, right? No, morphine and Dilaudid. Morphine and Dilaudid that you would take home as pills? Yeah. Oh, they have morphine and Dilaudid pills? I guess I knew they had morphine pills. Two separate. Oh, I was okay. getting morphine and then I was getting Dilaudid for breakthrough. Okay. Oh, okay. Dilaudid, is that a pill though? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, they were little yellow P4s. Oh, okay. I didn't know that they made them in pill form. So you had prescriptions for morphine and Dilaudid on your person for seven years. Okay. What did those seven years look like? Where did you live and did you work or what did you do? I got married about two years after I got out of the military. And for the first four years of getting those prescriptions, everything, I was doing them as I was say, told to, this and that. Well, one thing led to another. Somebody introduces me to a needle. So for the last three years or so, I was getting them. I was abusing them. So you yeah. were shooting your pills. You figured out how to melt them down and shoot them. Because okay. the, the Dilaudid, the yellow P4s, those you, you don't even have to filter. You can cold shake them. Like you just straight crush them, put them in the thing, shake it up and go. I mean, they're, they're like made for it. Okay. I mean, it was, yeah. And so it was just, it was the best case of a really bad situation. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah. So how did you get introduced to the needle? Who, who showed you and what was the circumstances around that? It was just one of those drinking with a friend and they said, you know, Hey, you know, you could get a lot more out of those if you did it this way. Okay. Damn. But you didn't buy more than your prescription that whole time? No. No. Wow. Um, okay. No, I didn't have a need to. I was getting 360 Dilaudid's and 240 of the uh, morphine 100s. Okay. A month. Yeah. This is a dumb question. Is that a lot? I went right to heroin. Yes. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's a lot. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, okay. Put it, put it like this. When uh, when they cut me back and somebody comes to me and says, hey, well, I know somebody that sells those on the street. So I attempted to purchase the equivalent on the street we're talking about ten thousand dollars <gasps> oh bag. wow oh my god so it was like nope can't do it so that's when you get told hey you know heroin does the same thing right dude so when you went in was there any awareness on the part of the pain management clinic that we should we should taper you down it's going to be uncomfortable or no they just handed you a bottle and said this is different here they didn't cut me off. They cut me way down. Right. That's what I mean. But they didn't taper you down to the new amount. No, no. It was literally one month and then the next. And they, they switched me to lower tabs. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Now, I yeah. do know that's like way different. Yes. Yeah. They they switched me to lower tabs. I mean, like four lower tabs a day. No, 120. Oh, months. my gosh. It was like, holy shit. So you were sick yeah. immediately. Exactly. Oh, my gosh. So you got married after two years. Yeah. Again, backing up to before they cut you off or they tapered you down. Were you working? Y'all had a kid, right? Didn't you have kids oh, too? I, I have I have twin sons. Okay. They, um, they're 15 years old. They okay. were born, me and my wife literally split up when they were 12 days old. Okay. Okay. Because she told me I needed to go to rehab and I told her she was crazy. Right. Sure. Of course. <laughs> so when in this process... And are you working or you're just on disability? What does your day-to-day -day life look like before um, they taper I, I you I have back? worked. I was the uh, foreman of a pallet company for about four years. Out of the last 15 years, I may have worked five. Would you shoot up like at work? Oh, yeah. Like, okay. All right. Oh, yeah, but you definitely. never needed to buy beyond your prescription. And did anybody ever mm -hmm. know or did you have any drug-related issues? I hit it pretty issues? well for a long time. I had okay. it. I had it like I said, uh, eventually my wife came to me and told me that 
you know, we had our kids were just born that I needed to get myself together. And you know, so, you know, eventually it did get obvious to people, but okay. for a long time I hid it. Was that before they tapered you back or afterwards? Oh, no, I went well after. Well after. Okay, right. So you were actually, I guess what I'm driving at is not that anybody ideally would be living using a needle every day, but you were still in your marriage and working. Things sound like they really went off a cliff after they tapered you back. That's when things got bad. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because that was when the introduction of buying them from someone else came in. Because yeah. before that, I was getting them from, you know, my my first drug dealer, you know, the doctor. Yeah, totally. Because <laughs> that, that my first drug dealer was a doctor, 100%. At that time, did you think I have a problem? Like, once you started using a needle, did you think, this is problematic? Or did you think, this is my prescription? It's okay. No, no. I, I knew I knew I was, I knew I was getting out there. Did she know you were using a needle? Yeah. The domino effect, you know, you, you get so far out there before you it really catches up to you mentally because it's crazy what we can get used to. Right. Yes. I also, one of the best definitions I ever heard for rock bottom is when you can't lower your standards fast enough to meet like your behavior, right? Because like, if it's just a little change, you can lower your standard to that. You know, it's like, well, I was snorting oxys, but now I'm going to smoke heroin. I'm not shooting it. I'm going to smoke heroin. And then you've been smoking heroin for a year. And then it makes more sense to get on a needle, you know, and then you're on a needle. And then after six months, you start sharing needles. And it's like, if you had gone from oxys to sharing needles, under a bridge heroin, that would have been a quick jump. But when you make these little slides, you can lower yes. what's That's okay that for you. That's effect. Yeah, exactly. 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 So they taper you back. And then what starts to happen? How soon are you buying heroin after like that day? Probably within two months. Okay. All right. Because like I said, I originally like out gate, I started trying to buy them, you know, a retail price from other people. And it was like, holy shit. I'm sick as a dog. I get told, hey, well, you know, heroin will do the same thing. This is before fentanyl came into play. You know? Okay. Yeah. Because nowadays there is no heroin. Right. Yeah. I've heard that. Did you tell the clinic, y'all, I'm sick and they didn't care? Basically. Okay. Fuck. All right. So you start buying heroin and then how long after that? So that's within it's about two months. When does your wife get pregnant and then say you're done? Within a year. Okay. All right. So that happens pretty quickly. Okay. And then what does your life start to look like? Where do you go? What starts to happen then? The fall to that bottom and then staying in that bottom happened quickly. Within six months, I'm homeless. I'm living in abandoned houses. I'm shooting. I, my entire life circled around nothing but that needle. That was the only thing that mattered to me. My family didn't matter. My kids didn't matter. Nothing. My life didn't matter. I did not care if I lived or died. I spent every single day expecting it to be my last day, and I was happy with it. So long as I had my fix, nothing else mattered. Nothing. Did you do anything else besides heroin? Like, did you start bringing meth into the equation? or? I never was big on uppers, but I called myself a trash can addict. Basically, meaning if my DOC was not available, I took what was. Like, I never smoked crack. I've never smoked crack in my life, but I have shot a lot of crack. Okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? That, yeah. and, and that was, to me, that was the only method to do a substance was to break it down and inject it. Me too. If I couldn't shoot it, I didn't want to do it. Yeah. Like, if I relapsed tomorrow, I would use a needle. You know what I mean? I mean, maybe not right away because I know it's just fentanyl now or whatever. But like to me, I feel like once you move to IV use, that becomes the only thing you want to do. Like I would stay sick if I had heroin and foil, but my rig broke until I found a new needle. You know what I mean? Preaching to the choir. So how did you have money every day to buy anything? Well, like I said, I'm a service connected veteran. Uh, so I get a pension check from the military and then I sold I sold everything whatever i did i would sell oh okay basically the cycle for me would be uh, when i'd get my check on the first of the month i would buy a lot and then i would sell a little bit and then that re-up would get, so that right there would trickle me through the month you know what i mean so i never sold enough to really get ahead i was selling to keep my 
itself afloat through the whole month. But you were able to actually sell enough to maintain. I would always, I I wanted to be able to sell it. I was very disciplined. Oh, you I, were? I, I was, okay. I was able to be disciplined with it. I was one of those type that, you know, I would say this eight ball is to do, these other seven are to sell. Yeah, you know, you know, straight like it. How many years did that go on where you're homeless, buying and using drugs? Almost 10 years. Wow. Okay. Where did you live during that time or where were you homeless? I was in Richmond, Virginia for a while. I was in Danville, Virginia for a while. And then I was in jail in between. I've been to jail probably eight or 10 times. I've done like a total of two years between 10 times of being in jail. So I've never done a lot of time in a single, you know, the longest I ever did was like eight months. What would you get arrested for? What kind of stuff? My original first time I ever got in trouble was I took some copper from a burnt down condemned building. That was originally what I got put on probation for. You didn't do meth, but that's some true tweaker shit. So how did you get caught and how do you strip it? You take it out. I actually don't know how to do this. You take it yeah. out of the walls or something? Where is it? Well, see, this this was literally a burnt down building. Okay. Okay. And so, I mean, it was like crumbled and stuff. And so, like, literally, he's just going in there ripping stuff out. Okay. It was like exposed in the walls and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And what's, what's crazy to me, I mean, it was a burnt down condemned building. But because there was a neighbor that seen me, and that's how I ended up getting caught, because I went in there. Before I went in there at like early in the morning before the sun came up to get it out. So they charged me with statutory burglary, midnight burglary, which is to enter a premises to murder, rape, or maim. What? Yeah, that's a five to 20. It, that's a, like a serious offense. How did they justify that? What happened was, is I had four charges, two grand larcenies, two uh, statutory burglaries, because there was twice, right? It was twice that I got called about. And I've never had a, a handcuff put on me in my life. I mean, I don't, I don't, I've never been in any trouble. I don't know the system. So they came to me and told me that they would cut a deal. They would drop one of them if I pled guilty to the other three. And so I pled guilty to it. The level of offense was uh, five to 20. So each one carried between five minimum up to 20 years. So I had three of them. So the minimum they could give me was 15 years. And then the most they could give me was 45. I mean, the most they could give me was 60. So did you have a public defender that said, don't do this? No, I had a public defender that told me this was a good deal. Oh, my gosh. That's <laughs> insane. But like, hold on, because I've never heard of that statutory thing either. So even though no one lived there, they yeah, charged you with that nighttime. anyways? Okay. Because it was dark. Okay. It's what they call midnight burglary. That sounds like some Southern shit. It's man, that's that's some Virginia shit. Yeah, right. Exactly. A exactly. Commonwealth state. Yes, it's, it's a Commonwealth state. That's in that right there. Because honestly, what I did should have been breaking and entering at right. very most. Right. At very yeah. most. Honestly, it should have just been trespassing and grand larceny. Right. Because yes. I mean, I didn't, I didn't break into the place. It was, right. It was wide open. Right. I, I, yeah. went, I went to a pile of rubble. And we're yeah. pulling metal out of it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, totally. And then I get put on probation, and I, I violated my probation four times. Okay. So I have some random questions. When yeah. you would go get the copper, but you were homeless, how did you transport it? to? A, you had a car? I would have a car, or a buddy would have a car. Okay, okay. Because, see, it was... I got called for two times. I probably went in there 50. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so you don't end up doing any jail time, though. I, I did for like that. six months. Oh, you yeah, did? did like you did months. do six yeah. months. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So how did that happen? You pled guilty to three, and they could have given you 15 years, but you got six months. How did all that shake out? The way they do it in uh, Virginia specifically is they give you a lot of time, and then they suspend most of it, and then oh. that's over your head while you're on probation. Okay. They gave me 15 years to suspend it, 14 years, six months. Oh, shit. Wait, is that what you're still on probation for right now? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> no. All right. Okay, what okay. I'm on probation for now is uh -huh. 10 times crazier. All right. Okay. I'm on probation now literally for being a nice guy. Okay. All right. So let's get there. All right. So you go to jail for six months and this begins your probation violations over the years. It sounds like. 
Okay. So then what type of things are you violating probation for over the years? Absconding. Just not okay. showing up. Not checking um, in. The very first one, I failed a drug test for marijuana. And so they gave me two months for that. And then the second, third, and fourth one, I did what they call absconded, which means I just wouldn't show up. I knew I was dirty. I just wouldn't go. And so then they would pick me up. Okay. How did you only fail that test for marijuana and not opiates? Because my charge is out of Virginia, but my probation, I have what's called an interstate compact where I would do my probation in North Carolina. In North Carolina, they don't do lab tests. They do the stick, the, you know, instant test and, you know. Okay. All right. So you just got away with it, but you would have been high on whatever heroin that day also. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. So how many years are going by with these random probation violations and being homeless? And I was on that, that stint of probation for like eight years. Okay. All right. Something like that. Okay. And then what are you on probation for right now? What's the next (laughs) crazy thing you said happened? What happened was, is this girl, Ashley, gets beat up by her boyfriend, Steve. Okay. Should you use both of their names? Is that okay? You don't care? Oh, absolutely. I don't care. All right. Okay. All right. So what happened was, is Steve beats her up. She calls the law. The law comes. He won't answer the door. They ask her, well, do you have anywhere that you can go that you would feel safe? I'm friends with the guy, Steve. I don't even know the girl like that. She knew I had a place. She said, well, if you take me to David's, he'll let me stay over there tonight. It's like midnight. All of a sudden, somebody knocks at my door. I live in the hood. I open the door, and this girl's standing there with a T-shirt and, it, in her T-shirt and underwear with some papers in her hand crying, saying, Steve beat me up. Can I come in and stay? There's a cop. Cop didn't even get out of the car. The cop's sitting in the middle of the road. I was like, what the fuck? You come to my house at midnight in the hood with a cop? So I said, get your ass in here. <laughs> so the next morning when we get up, she tells me that Steve broke her phone, asked me if she could use mine. I don't think anything of it. Well, a couple of days goes by. She ends up taking off with some other guy. No big deal. Well, all of a sudden, a cop comes to my door. I answer the door. I'm like, uh, what's going on? They said, well, Mr. Riggins, we need you to come downtown and talk with us. I'm like, what the fuck? Well, they take me downtown, come to find out. <laughs> the girl, she called this other guy and made arrangements for him to beat her boyfriend up. Oh, no. And so her and this the guy she left off with go and pick the guy Steve up, telling him they're going to go get some drugs. They're going down the road. They pull in this side road. The guy just stops in the middle of the road. Steve's like, what the hell's going on? This other car comes pulling up. The drug dealer that they were that they were actually going to meet, he jumps out of the car. He's got a sawed-off shotgun in his hand. When he comes running up to the truck, as he grabs the door handle, the girl Ashley goes like that and kicks Steve out the car. Dude took the gun and just started beating him in the head with it. Almost killed him. Oh, my God. Leaves him on the side of the road for death. He makes it to a, a house there, calls 911, da-da-da. Well, when they pick the girl Ashley up, she tells him that, I arranged, that I'm the one that set it all up come to find out when she used my phone she was texting him setting it all up right okay so they tell me that they're going to charge me with conspiracy to commit attempted murder and armed robbery i'm like holy shit uh they're talking about life in prison oh my gosh okay and um so they lock me up they hold me with no bond my sister's actually a clerk at the courthouse she comes to my bond here and and we get it approved for me to have a ten thousand dollar bond on the condition that I came out to the family land, which is in North Carolina. This happened in Virginia, where I'm at right now. So I literally, I wasn't even allowed to go to my, my own house to pack my stuff up. I lost my house, everything. Well, a couple of days goes by, and my lawyer calls me and says, um, I got some bad news. And what's that? Girl, Ashley's signed a deal. She's going to testify. I'm like, what the fuck? That bitch is going to testify on me? The next day, I get another phone call. I got good news. Said, what's that? The guy, Trey, the drug dealer, the one that beat him in the head, he's signed now. He's going to testify. I was like, how the fuck is that good news? They said, you don't understand. The Commonwealth understands that you are the least culpable in the case. So they're willing to offer you a deal to sign also. Huh? They said, so what happens is all three of you sign deals. Nobody testifies. There is no trial. Everything just takes care of itself. I'm like, holy shit, that kind of makes sense. So, of course, I go sign. Well, about a month goes by, I get a phone call. You need to be at a court in the morning. Like, for what? 
the guy, Trey, the drug dealer, backs out of his deal at the last minute. So I, I'm forced. I have to go to court. But when I go to court, I talked to the Commonwealth and I straight told her, I was like, I don't know what good I am to you. I wasn't there. I know this guy, but, you know, I wasn't a witness to nothing. And so she never calls me in the court. But because I came, I was there, I still did my, my part. She felt that it was not in the state's best interest to call me as a witness because what I would have testified to wouldn't have helped them. The guy ended up getting 15 years. Oh, wow. Traded? Well, he, what happened was, is he actually, he was wanted on it and tried to run, wrecks the car has a bunch of drugs and guns. So, I mean, he didn't get to 15 years just for that. You know, it was everything in combination. The girl, Ashley, she signed a plea deal for three years. Well, then what they did was, is so she got her three years, and then the very next day they violated her probation and gave her three more years for that. So she's doing six years right now. The guy, Trey's doing 15 years. And my deal was, was that I would get no jail time, but I'd be on probation. And I was on probation. I'm on probation for two years. I got put on probation December 16th, 2022. That's why I get off probation in three months. Okay. Okay. So when do you finally get sober? December 20th, 2022. So just right after that happened. That's, that's when I lost my leg. Okay. All right. So that's what I want to talk about too. So you're on probation for a long time based on this copper stealing larceny. And I'd only thing. been off probation for four months when this oh, new no. charge came up. Of course. Four months. I did so, three. So you get off probation. How did you even have a place? Your, your pension was you were able to get somewhere? When I got off probation, when I finished my probation, what happened was is when I violated the fourth time, he told me that he agreed that I actually shouldn't have been violated that time. It was because of the COVID stuff. The office was shut down. It, it was a whole a misunderstanding. But he said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you six months and take you off probation. Like, deal. So I did six months. I got out the first of January. And this right here was in May when the new thing happened. So what happened, that six months I was in jail, I had six checks. So, you know, when I got out, got I it. had money to get a place. Got it. Okay. So before that six months, that finally ends that first charge. In any of those years, do you ever go to rehab? Do you go to AA, NA meetings? Do you detox? Is there any attempt at recovery during that time? The only attempt was on my third violation, I was facing three to six months. I was serious. I wanted to change my life. I found out about this program called the Bridge Ministry. It was a Christian-based program in Buckingham, Virginia. It was 18 months long. And so I went to the judge and asked the judge to sentence me to this 18 month long program. And he looked at me and said, I, I sat in jail for 72 days before I went to court. He said, you've been in jail for almost three months. Your guidelines are three to six months. I could literally let you go today. But you're asking me to go to an 18 month long program. I looked at him and said, sir, I'm going to be honest with you. I've been in jail for almost three months which means I've got about $7,000 in my checking account right now. If you let me go today, I'm going to have a needle in my arm in two hours. So uh, he let me go. But he, what happened, he actually, he let me go, but he sent it, he, he like paused my sentencing until after the program was over, but sentenced me to three years in the penitentiary. It was saying, basically, we would we would come back to this after you get out. In other words, if you fuck up in the program. You got three years. You're going three years in the penitentiary. All right. Okay. You know what I'm okay. saying? I, I was okay. only facing three to six months, and I yeah. turned that into diet. Three years so in I, prison. Was serious. Yeah, yeah. How did it go in that program? It was extremely strict, extremely strict. But I excelled. After 12 months of being in it, they, uh, they allotted me to go to a halfway house. It was in Charlottesville, Virginia. I actually was given, uh, there was a guy that went to church with us. He owned a company called Spectrum Integrators. I was offered a job as a commercial AV systems integrator. Basically, you think about going into a conference room, you got a projector, you have microphones, you have displays, or right, a systems integrator. So we, we would make everything talk to each other. And so my job was to populate racks, server racks. I was, for some reason, my mind, I was just able to look at a, at a wiring schematic for a server rack and I could just figure out that spaghetti. I was, I was really good at it. So I was making 
the best money of my life. Out of, when I came out of that program, I, I got a job making very good money. I was making like 160 a year. Yeah, I mean, you know, to be given an opportunity like that was it, it was wild. But that's my only time. That's the only program or anything like that that I ever did. So what happened with that job? You ended up using it again? Well, actually, actually, what happened was is I ended up, I met this girl. Me and her moved in together. Everything was going great. She was a nurse at UVA. They had a secret cocaine habit I didn't know about. Okay. You know, she's making almost as much money as I am. So, I mean, you know what I'm saying? We're bringing in well over a quarter million a year between the two of us. I mean, you know, it was, it's a little expensive in Charlottesville, but we were still, we were doing very, very good. I mean, so on top of that, you got to re- realize I also still get my, my VA income and that's considered non-taxable income. So, you know, I, I still got that on top of my other pay. So we, we were doing pretty good. Well, I got to looking at the checking account one day and was like, how are we almost broke? What the fuck? And so we ended up, the secret ended up coming out. And so she worked third shift. And when she pulled up at the apartment, I was outside in the parking lot, leaned up against my car. She asked, what was I doing? I told her I was waiting to, for her to pull up so I could tell her goodbye. And said, I will never be able to get ahead so long as I'm with you. So I left. And it was two and a half hour drive straight down 29 to get to Danville. I'm in Charlottesville. Danville, Virginia is where that's where I'm from from. So I call my boss as I'm driving down the road. I'm, like, I'm not going to make it to work today. I got to take a couple of personal days, which led into me coming down. I get drunk with a buddy of mine and I end up getting high. Okay. <laughs> so I All literally, right. I left her because of her secret habit. Yeah. I, within two days, I had a needle in my arm. Okay. And I hadn't done anything in two years. Yeah. So I want to ask you about the program. You said that you excelled, but you clearly didn't have like a plan in place in an instance like this, right? So what about the program did work for you at the time, but why do you think you were still vulnerable when this happened? I'm the type of individual that I do well in structure. And it was a very organized, militaristic, structurized Christian program. This pastor, uh, William Washington, he, he ran it. He was actually, the, the man was in prison himself for being a drug dealer. He accepts the Lord to his heart. He goes into an 18-month Christian program as part of his deal to get out of prison. And when he gets out of the program, he opens his own. That was the pastor that I was under. He was an ex-drug dealer. So he still had a lot of street in him. You know what I'm saying? He was very, very militaristic. And my brain just works well with that structurized system. Once my, once any sort of structure falls out of place, if, if I don't, you know what I'm saying? I can veer off. And so that's why I have to be careful. Right. Because like in 12 step, we go to meetings and you have contacts and recovery and stuff. When you got out, were there meetings that you went to or was there a community attached to that rehab that you would stay in contact with and you just didn't? Or was there any, like, um, are there meetings in a Christian rehab? I don't know. Yeah, well, somewhat. Somewhat. Okay. Um, okay. We had a lot of, a lot of classes. We did a lot. We There was a, a multitude of pastors from in the community that would come and teach different things, which were never about recovery. We learned nothing about recovery. It was all about learning the ins and outs of the Bible. That's what I was wondering. Okay. So while you were there and you were in that routine, you did well, but there wasn't any sort of like lasting plan in place. There was no structure. Sounds like, yeah. right. And yeah, when you moved exactly. out. Okay. The, the foundation was not built. That's the secret to being successful in recovery yes, I is agree. to properly build your foundation. I agree with that. I agree with that. So you start using again, and then how long is it until you lose your leg? Two years. Okay. How uh, do you lose this, your leg? Uh, not about a year and a half, two years, something like that. So like I said, December 16th, 2022, I got out of jail. I did 35 days prob- for my probation violation because I had uh, absconded. So November 7th, I got locked up. December 16th, I get out. I walked out of jail with nothing. I had no body. I was completely depressed. I was I was just lost. I didn't even have anywhere to sleep. Well, I called a buddy of mine up. He tells me I could come to his place. I went there. I buy a $20 bag of fentanyl. I haven't done anything in 35 days, remember? Well, when I come to, got ice down my pants. They done Narcan me. I done fell and busted the whole side of my face open. 
I immediately looked at him and said, I was finally where I wanted to be. Why the fuck would you bring me back? So I got up the next morning with a plane. I bought $80 worth. I put it all in the spoon at the same time, the whole $80 worth. When I came to, I came to and I'm in a room. It's, it's kind of dark in the room. It's nighttime. And my left leg right at my calf. There's something sticking out at the side of my leg. I have the most immense pain I've ever felt in my life. I can't even I like I can't even lift myself up. I thought because of the life I'm living and such, I literally thought somebody had broken the house and stabbed me and there was a knife sticking out of the side of my leg. I start screaming. My buddy that I'm staying at his trailer, he's like I'm I'm in a room of this end of the trailer, he's in a room with this end of the trailer, all the way to the other end, right? He comes running in there. I'm like, dude, somebody stabbed me. Somebody stabbed me. He flips the light on. He says, oh, my God, no, you've been burned. I looked down. And that thing that was sticking out of the side of my leg was where I had been burned so bad that my skin had, like, liquefied. And it ran and crystallized. So it was like a big scab, basically. Just a burnt, crispy piece of me is what I was looking at. 85% of my left leg was third degree burns. We're talking bone and ligament exposed. What happened was, is apparently I was kind of stumbling around and stuff in an inebriated state and I fall, a kerosene heater falls on me and uh, burned it that bad. So I spent from then until February 8th, 2023, you know, from November 20th, I mean, December 20th, 2022 to February 8th, 23. 50 some year. days yeah like no like 50 some oh, days okay 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 you know december of 22 to february 23 okay 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 okay. i'm in the icu burn unit at chapel hill north carolina uh, unc they did six surgeries while i was there the first couple they're like clean up you know and then they like the third like the fourth one and that's when they were like sorry we're gonna have to cut it off oh my gosh they amputate me below the knee i'm above the knee now they amputate me below the knee. Within two days, my leg starts doing this, and it locked like that. Your knee? My leg, yes. My knee locked at like a 70-degree angle, so it was like an L. What happened was, remember that injury from when I was in the military? The ligaments, they said that um, the best that they could figure the reason why it drew up like it did was basically the ligaments were, were tight, and so when it once that got cut off, like they, they drew up. I leave the hospital, as I said, a below the knee amputee. Around the first of May, all right, you have two bones that go from your knee to your ankle. You have your fibula and your tibula. All right, my fibula bone, when they amputated, they didn't cut it off. They didn't round it off good. So it starts cutting me from the inside out. Around the first of May, it bursts through the skin. Woo! Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's when the bone infections start on uh, October the 10th, 2023. So almost exactly a year ago, this time the VA hospital, the Veterans Hospital in Durham, North Carolina, they did the above the knee amputation. But you got to realize something. When I got burned, I'm on opiates, right? So when I go to the hospital, they had me on Dilaudid. I was getting Dilaudid. I was getting oral, oral Dilaudid once every four hours, IV Dilaudid once every four hours. So I would stagger them. So every two hours, I would get one or the other, right? Then when they would do a dressing change, when they would come in and do like a, a sponge bath, and change my bandage, they would give me an extra dose of each, okay? So that's 14 doses of Dilaudid a day. And I'm on a ketamine drip, three different, you know, a session, like five days or four days on a ketamine drip, three different times. So when I leave the hospital, my tolerance, like I, my addiction is still here. You know what I'm saying? Even though by the time I got out of the hospital, I had made the mental choice that I wanted to change. My physical need was still way there. I literally left the hospital on February the 8th. and I went to the methadone clinic on February 9th. I walked in the method. Well, I rolled in the methadone clinic from the first day. And I told them that my desire was to titrate down. I want to stop. They said, that's not what we do. That's what, that's what I do. So it's crazy because literally, I, like I said, the first part of May is when that bone busted the skin, okay? Not even two weeks before the bone busted the skin was my last day at the methadone clinic, okay? So here's the point, all right? 
by late August, first of September, I had had so many bone infections. They kept fighting and they couldn't stop it because they were hoping that they could just like basically patch over, you know, grind off that, that bit of bone that was sticking out and just kind of put a patch over it kind of deal. Well, they came to me and they said, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to cut more off. I said, well, you're not going to use narcotics. Said, that's not an option. You can't have your leg cut off without narcotics. I said, well, that's what I desire. They made me sign a waiver to agree to cut my leg off without using any opiates. Yeah, check this. I come out of anesthesia. I had my surgery. I went into surgery at 4 o'clock on October the 10th, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. 8.30 p.m., I came into a uh, pre-op. I came out of surgery, right? Well, as soon as I wake up, my whole body starts going like that. I hit My blood pressure hit 240 over 180. They didn't give me a choice. They said, we have to give you a shot of Dilaudid or you're going to die. I actually tried to fight them in the pre-op room and told them that if you put that in me, I am going to die. <laughs> they were trying to give me a, a four milligram shot of Dilaudid. We finally agreed on a half of a milligram shot and it worked. It brought my blood pressure down. It alleviated. Here's how I was able to be successful with this journey. I, I had two catheterized nerve blocks installed. Okay. There was like these balls. They were pressurized balls. They had a numbing agent in it. And then it was like one in the front and one in the back. And my sciatic nerve and another, I, I don't remember the other one. So basically they were like, they were, in, they were catheters. They were in my skin and they would just like, over time, the pressure would just force it in a little drip, a little drip. I get out. Like I said, this is 8.30 p.m. October 10th. At lunchtime on October 11th, the doctor came in and said, Mr. Riggins, do you realize that your sole purpose for being here at this point is for pain management? That's what he mean. Do you continue to refuse? Because I, I refuse. I never took a single one. I had a, an at request for morphine and one for glotted. I never took a single one. And he said, if you're going to continue to refuse your pain medication, you realize that all you're going to do is sit in the bed. You can do that at home. I said, write the discharge papers. So I literally, I literally have video at four o'clock in the afternoon on October 10th in the pre-op room saying, you know, I'm going to go live as soon as I can. Otherwise, remember, I love y'all, you know, just in case. And then at 5 p.m. on October 11th, me in the car with my dad holding up my stump, wiggling it, saying, guess who's already out? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I want to, I want to unpack this a little bit. Yeah. This is about a year ago. That Almost they, exactly a year ago. When, and remind me again, what do you consider your sobriety date? What's your sobriety date? My sobriety date is December 20th, 2022. Before that's the this. day I got burned because that's the, not oh, that's the not day the you got burned. Okay. Prescription stuff. I understand. That's the last time I put a needle in my arm. That's fair. I think that that's you, you totally legitimate. So of course. Me, that's my recovery date because. For sure. You know, that's when life changed. I agree with that. I've taken pain medication after surgeries uh, three times or twice in sobriety. I didn't reset my sobriety, obviously. No, I'm, I'm with you on that. So how long were you knotted out for that burn to take place? Do you know? I don't know, but it had okay. to have been a good while. Hours, right? Yeah, while it, it was burning your skin away. Yeah. Okay. It got it. Been. Okay. Okay. So during that time, while you're in the hospital and then you're getting out and you're below the knee and then you go back in, your desire to stay off drugs, you know, recreational drugs. Talk to me about when you came to that decision, was it like when you were looking at the burned leg and you're like, this has to stop? Was it when you woke up? What was your thought? Well, see, here's the deal. When I was in that hospital from December 20th, 22 to February 8th, 23, I, one of the reasons why I was in there that long was I, they, they installed a pick line, right? Through my bicep here going to my heart. Okay. Well, all of a sudden one day I started getting massive fevers. They can't figure it out. They're pumping with me with antibiotics. They're doing this. They can't figure it out. It just keeps coming back. Every time the IV antibiotics were done, they would come back. It was like 20 some days that I had like really, really serious fevers. I had a doctor come in and ask me if my whole family had come see me. Like and my mom and them, I was like, you really need to have them all come see you. They thought I wasn't going to lift them to get out the bed. That's how serious it was. Well, then a couple days later, the same doctor comes in and is like, they thought about your pick line. I'm like, what? 
Well, come to find out what had happened was that they accidentally had left and had some bacteria on the tip of the pick line. So they gave me a bacterial infection in my heart. Here's the point with that. See, I'm a Christian and I believe that, see, I, I have people ask me if I credit God for getting me clean. I say yes and no. Here's why. I believe that God knows that I'm hard headed. And so he made me sit in that bed for a month more than I should have to give me time to resonate on the fact that not a single friend from the street came to see me. Zero. None. They didn't care if I lived or died. And so that's when I, the, the, what really mattered, the family that I had turned my back on for so long, that's who was there. So that's why I say yes and no. I say yes, because I believe that God set the situation. I say no, because as a man with free will, I, I accepted the gift that was being offered, if that makes any sense. So that's when the concept for heal came, came to mind, you know, to be there for people. So as you sat there, it occurred to you, not a single friend has come to see me. I don't want to live like this anymore. The streets who I dedicated my entire life, I've given my whole life to. I've, I've abandoned my family, my, the true ones that cared about me, all for a substance, all for others, given to people who didn't care if you lived or died. With Look, I got out of the hospital, put a post on Facebook saying that I was out. I get a phone call from the drug dealer that sold me the drugs when I lost my leg. That some bitch called me when I answered the phone, because I still had the same phone number I had I've had for you know years. I answered the phone. He said, uh, hey, man, I heard you was out of the hospital. I'm glad to hear it. I was just going to let you know I got that fire. I said, look here, motherfucker. I got enough fire from you last time. That showed you just how little give a fuck about people's lives. So they ain't the ones for me to care for. So that's when you get out and go on methadone because you leave with the habit, a physical habit, but you've decided I don't want to do this anymore. So you successfully get off the methadone, but then you have to go back in for the rest of the amputation. And that's when you say, I don't want a lot of, I don't want any pain management until they say you're going to, because you obviously were having, your body was an extreme shock that time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like I said, they gave me no choice. Right. Um, yeah. 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 No, listen, you should have taken that. <laughs> I would have continued, <laughs> but. Well, I, I would never tell anybody to do what I did. It right. was absolute miserable. Oh my God, it was the worst. Like the first two weeks, I did not sleep at all. I'm telling you, I did not sleep for two weeks. It was miserable. But see, here's the deal. I did not do that because I was afraid I was going to relapse. That's not at all why I did that. Because see, obviously I knew that I could have done the same steps I did before. I could have went to a, a methadone clinic and titrated down. I did it for this because that's the kind of man I am. I gave myself a personal challenge. I said, if you can survive this without narcotics, there ain't a damn thing life can ever throw at you to make you question your sobriety again. That's why I did it. And since then, you've been living with your parents, which is where you are right now. Okay. So in that time, is there anything you would call a program of recovery that you do, which could look like connecting with people on social media? It could look like inspiring others. Do you because you don't 100%. do twelve step or meetings, right? You no, don't do I'm not. I'm not a twelve stepper. Right. But okay. That you you just hit on the head where my strength and recovery comes from is from helping others, inspiring others. That's why I started the Heal Group. That's why we've the community efforts that we've done. March second, I took a group skydiving. If you look on my website, uh, heal family dot com. There's uh, the videography video from um, the skydiving event that I did. I don't know if you know Rachel Palanti, Mike Meadows, Jess Goins. I don't know if you know. Uh, um, Mike Meadows sounds familiar. Are they like sober social media people? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Joe Stan. Anyway, they, all four of them drove. Joe actually lives in Raleigh, but the rest of them, like Rachel Palanti, she drove like eight hours to come speak at it. Mike Meadows and Jess Goins, they're, they're like, oh, they're together. Um, I think they drove six hours to come speak at it. I had, I put a word out to my community that if anybody had lost anyone to overdose, to submit pictures. And we, we all wore collage shirts with, uh, in, in remembrance of lost, of lost loved ones and, um, did the first, that, that's actually going to be an annual event. Yeah. March the second was the first one. Uh, we do it at skydive Raleigh in Franklinton, North Carolina, right outside of Raleigh. 
guy Mike Hollister that owns that place there, he's a huge supporter of mine. The guy Ben Shank that did my videography, he's actually um let me know he's he's donating it next this next time. I don't that three hundred dollars I don't even have to pay. You know, he's he's volunteering to do it just because they believe in they they follow me, um uh, Ben Shank and uh I can't remember his old lady's name, but like all the, all the, um, the people that worked at Skydive Raleigh, the owner, all of them, they all follow me on social media. Yeah. So when did you start the heel group? Was it when you got out the second time or before you went in the second time? When I got out the second, when when I got out the second time is when I really started doing the community stuff. I started my social media uh, at the end of August, 13 months ago. I originally started it. And like I said, October the 10th, they had to do the above the knee amputation because I had been so ate up with bone infections and all this. It got so bad they had to cut it off. So if you go back and look at like the videos I did in August and September, they were before I got this, this second amputation done. And like, you can see I'm frail. I'm skinny. My face is all shrunk. I was, I was on the edge of death. And honestly, <laughs> this might sound whatever, but see, I, my mentality, I told myself that if I would have died on December 20th, 2022, I would have left the legacy of just some drug addict. And my determination was, was that now when I die, I'm determined to leave behind the legacy of a man that truly cared for his community. And that's why I focus so hard on, on what I do. Uh, the, the sheriff of the county here that I live in, Caswell County, North Carolina, me and him, I've got videos on my website of me and him in church together giving testimony. I mean, you know, that same man investigated me when I was a drug dealer 20 years ago. Me and him sat in his office and had that talk a couple months ago. Oh, yeah. yeah. What did y'all say um, to each other? Well, see, what happened was is I ran into him at the courthouse because when I'm on probation, I have to pay a $40. I had to pay $40 every month for being on probation. So I got to go to the courthouse once a month. I ran into him there and I told him, I was like, I have a hatred for fentanyl. I want to open a recovery center. That's my goal. That's that's everything I do is all is all trickling to the end goal is to open a recovery center. That's what it's all about. And so he he told me he asked me if I could come to his office the next day. We could talk about it. I go. We sit down. He told me that uh, that he had been wanting someone like me for a long while. He had first church that we went to had asked him to come in and speak about fentanyl. But like he said, he, he can know, he could tell him stuff out of a book, but I could tell him experience because this church had lost three of their members of the congregation to fentanyl within the last six months previous to this event, you know, me running into him. So that's what started that. So in this year, have you dealt with any desire to use again, like a craving to use again? It sounds like no, but have you? No. Okay. Okay. I actually, um, I have not had like personally like, been beside somebody, but I've had several phone conversations with people when I could just hear it in their voice. You know, I could tell they were, even though, you know, whatever, even, even if they wanted to lie about it, I've, I had one of them that was straight up about it, but it's sickened me to, to sit there and, and. Oh, that was high. You mean talking to someone yeah, high? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 But okay. but I haven't um I haven't been around anybody that was high, but I just I've been on the phone with a couple of people that you could tell they were. It turned my stomach. Yeah, 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 yeah. So in this year, I'm sure you have had various challenges of will, like or maybe you haven't. Am I doing the right thing? It, or you know, because I think all human beings feel like it's you might feel like this isn't happening on the timeline that I want. I wanted more funding by now. I, I wanted to be on, I wanted to have this amount of reach and I don't. Have you experienced those feelings and how do you work through them? Not really. Um, okay. All right. I've been, I've been amazed at the feedback because at the end of the day, the message is going to reach the ears that need to hear it. Yeah. And you're able to just relax into that idea. That's amazing. Cause I don't feel that well, way. <laughs> see, um, you know, back, back to this, this mission with the van right here. My end thing with that right there is, is that I hope to build the YouTube to a point where we can monetize it to where it can. I, and I mean, I ain't dreaming of nothing big. I just, I'm hoping to make it at least enough to help me cover gas and, and expenses. You know what I'm saying? But in the meantime, I've dumped my entire 
VA disability check into it. Uh, either way, I'm still doing I'm still doing everything exactly the same, so I can keep it alive long enough for the audience to catch up. I mean, you know, w- by the time I get on the road, because uh, remember, I get off probation on December 16th. I'll be on the road first of January. Right, right. And by the way, that's what you just said. I think is really I- ideal that you do feel like I'm good with where I'm at, and I'm able to be present in the moment. That's something I strive for all the time. That's actually, you know, like why I asked that. When you, what does the rehab look like when you have a prosthetic on? And this is probably, and stop me if this is like too much to ask, but. Uh, There's no such thing with me. Okay. Does it still feel like, do you take a step forward from your hip flexor and it still moves forward, but obviously you're not getting the feedback from your foot as you walk. So what was that process like? This leg right here, Uh I've only had for like two weeks. Oh, okay. Okay. My new leg is a microprocessor driven knee. It, I mean, like I actually have to plug it up every night, like a cell phone. I have an app on my phone that it connects to that you, you do the adjustments like resistance, how hard it throws, how, you know, how much resistance gives you when you sit down. Okay. This thing's actually got a sensor in it oh, to where like when you're okay. walking, if you're, if you come to like a step or something to step over, it actually takes the foot and tips it back just a hair to, to assist you with it. It's wild. Oh, wow. Um, it's called a okay. Quattro. Okay. Um, it's Q-U-A-T-T-R-O. It, extremely expensive. A couple hundred grand. I mean, I couldn't believe the VA approved it. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then I showed you the, um, the artwork that we yeah. did on the top of it. Yeah, know. that's very cool. That was actually my, my marketing teacher when I was in high school, Miss Joe Page says that she drew that for me. Oh, recently? Like you reached out to her again? What? No, yeah, yeah. It's, oh, that's but, cool. Like I said, the, the, the heel group I have, is not even a year old now. Right. That's what I mean. So like your marketing high school teacher recently drew your, your logo. That's cool. I love that. That's awesome. Yeah, she's actually a big supporter of mine. She's donated... Uh, she's one of them that's donated money to me a multitude of times. Yeah. Uh, she's, she's a big supporter. Are you able to do, do you like work out? Are you into fitness and stuff? Cause you're, I'm looking oh, yeah. at you, you're like lean. So how do you work out with your let? Is it the exact same? What kind of stuff do you do? Yeah. For the most part, I'm a very active individual. I'm in pretty good shape. Yeah. I mean, I guess you can lift weights. If you're not doing cardio, everything would basically be the same, right? Pretty much. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I don't run, but I didn't run before I lost my legs. So what's the difference, dude? I don't, I don't run either. Fuck it. <laughs> like, you see me run and trust and believe you better. Too. <laughs> you better run also. So I want to kind of like zoom out and just look at like all of this. So if we can go back to you in those first seven years when you're on the clinic after that initial injury to now, a lot has happened. Do you feel like when you look back, are you grateful for where you landed? Or would you say, no, I really wish I could have kept my leg. I really wish I could have kept my wife. Well, I actually, as I said, I'm a Christian. And I actually, honestly, I thank the Lord daily for taking my leg. I thank the Lord every single day for it. Because see, here's the thing. I was at a trajectory at that point of death. As I said, when I lost my leg, it was actually a suicide attempt. So if you think about it, I wanted to not be here anymore. I didn't want to exist anymore. And the Lord gave me a, a way to die, but to re- be reborn in a whole nother life. And that's that's why I think I do. Honestly, I thank the Lord daily for sitting my hard headed tail down and forcing me to look at what I was really doing to myself, my family and my community. I know this because I heard you and Dave talk about it, but just to touch on this, your sons, you're not in contact with them, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So do you have any idea if they know that you're sober now or what you're doing? Are you hoping you hear from them when they're 18? Maybe what's your, where are you at with that? Yeah. That's, that's basically where that ends up. Cause like I said, they're 15 now. Okay. They were born on the 4th of July, 2009. And I've been in contact with her mother a few times, and it's just not going to happen. Okay. 
And it's one of those where we're we're at a point now where it's close enough. It's like, you know what, bitch, I'll just wait till they're 18 and then you ain't got no, nothing to do with it. So I'll be honest. I know a lot of people in that situation. I actually, my first boyfriend in recovery was in drug court and he had a son who was like, I think three and he wasn't able to, con- to talk to the child at all. And that looked like he probably was never going to be able to, right. Didn't matter what he did. And he had his sponsor recommended if he wanted to, to over the years, get him a Christmas gift and a birthday gift and just start to keep it somewhere like in a big chest so that when he reached out at 18, hopefully. Good show. Yes. Yeah. He could say, I never forgot you. I knew you were playing soccer. I got you this when you turned six. Do you know what I mean? And I always thought that that was a really cool thing no, to that's, do. That's, that's a sweet concept. Right? It's a good idea, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and then if they do, and then I feel like you're also especially with your beliefs, which are similar to mine, definitely like energetically, you are, I think, setting up a pathway for them to come back into your life through spirituality somehow. Like you're attracting them back into your life by putting the energy into it, though they may not know, like they'll know here. You know what I mean? Uh, I'm with you there. You know, I'm with you so there. you should also write a book. You know, uh, uh, Patrick, because about Boston 2%. Yes. Do you know him? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, he is. He has been on me yeah. about doing that because, you know, him, him with the meth Bible. Yeah. Um, And then uh, do you know Nicole Chattinger, Nicole Victorious? I think she's got like 400,000 on TikTok. No. Uh, um, but you should introduce was, me to her. Should I interview her? Oh, uh, yes. She is. Okay. That's that's my that's my best friend. Oh, OK. I uh, guess. Is she sober? Is she in recovery or recovered yeah. life? So. Where can everybody connect with you? All of the places you would like people to go to connect with you. The easiest is if you go to my website, which is the word heal dash family dot com. I'll put that in all the show notes and stuff, too. But just so you can go ahead and say it. But yeah, so it's uh, it, when you go to it, literally at the top of the page, it says follow the journey of the heal mobile. That gets you know, YouTube. And directly beneath that, it says follow the journey on all platforms. That takes you to my link tree, which has everything listed. And then uh, we sell shirts. I have like 17 different designs. And they're all, each available in like 13 different colors a piece. Different heel family design stuff. Some some recovery um, saying things. And stuff. I don't know if you know Patrick Alicon. He's a recovery influencer too. Oh, okay, okay. He drew most all of my um, my graphic designs that I have. I think I, he's done drew me like four or five different ones. It's like the shirt that I'm wearing right now with the little heart with the heel. Oh, I love that. Every, I have a heel shirt for every day of the week. That's I, good. I you should keep doing that. Wear your brand. I wear my stuff every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's well, good. obviously with the leg, with the leg, I rock it continuously. <laughs> totally, totally. So last question, last question. Physical disabilities or even anything that is debilitating, not permanently, but like if you're sick, like a, a few years ago, I got this weird bacterial infection in my stomach called C. diff and it took him forever to figure out what it was. And I was on the floor in pain daily. And I even told my husband, I was like, I'm going to use if like they don't figure out what this is. It was going on for months. Pain is debilitating. Not being able to be fully mobile is debilitating. If somebody is listening right now that is in the middle of, or we don't even have to keep it physical, a mental health challenge that is debilitating, which you and I both know that they can be. Somebody Mm -hmm. is in the depth of feeling paralyzed and not able to take action in their life, though they may want to. What would you say to someone that feels like that right now that just really wants to make some changes but is struggling? One of the most important things I believe is the willingness to reach out to others because there are so many out there that they're literally waiting and, and willing to be there for you. That's like the, the Facebook group that I run. Everyone struggles. Let's lift each other up. I tell everybody the group that I run, although I'm in recovery from drugs, I don't ro- run a drug recovery group that not at all. My group is all about the fact that everyone has personal struggles, no matter what it may be, you know, childhood trauma, SADV, it doesn't matter, mental health, it, the list is as long as you're on. Basically, it doesn't matter what your backstory is, we can still heal together. That would be my biggest thing that I would tell somebody is no matter how hard it is, reach out because there is always plenty of us that are willing to accept that phone call at two o'clock in the morning and just sit there and listen to you. 
Well, thank you so much, David, for your time. I really appreciate it. I'm excited to watch your journey. Thank you for giving me a little van tour. <laughs> I love that <laughs> shit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, like I said, uh, in, come January, I'll be on the road and I'm, I'm going cross country. I'll be everywhere. Okay. Well, I'm in San Diego. So if you get out this way, you should, you know, there's a bunch of recovery centers out here. You could definitely speak at some places. You know, I'll be following you, but let me know as you get a little bit closer too. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank All you right. for your time. All right. I appreciate it.